I'll give you a quick overview over what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to give you a starting point of my thinking and we'll then look at open source starting with the freedoms and that's really a nice continuation from the movie uh, we've just been watching. I then go on to address questions of inter infrastructure and link some developments that are happening in open source that we have seen happening in open source for so many years to what not I call the third industrial revolution but uh, people much more uh, famous and uh, hopefully much more intelligent than myself. I'll then go on to look at the practice of open source and particularly what that means uh, for the design and artistic practice and we'll try to um, summarize or, or give, give some kind of outlook into what I feel uh, that we should be expecting over the coming 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. So let me start with the starting point and do some audience involvement at this point as well. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, where have you seen that before? Anybody? Newton. Yep. Anybody from the UK? So standing uh, uh, on the shoulders of giants is a, is a very ancient uh, aphorism, really goes back to the, to the medieval ages, and it's the image that dwarfs that sit on the shoulders of giants can see farther than the giants themselves can see. Um, this is an aphorism, and uh, you know, an aphorism is, is a short phrase that expresses some sort of idea and it's quite often ascribed to Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton uh, used the saying uh, in one of his letters um, actually when he was talking about uh, his theory of colors that he invented at the time and he was going I have seen further by standing on your shoulders of giants which uh, in, a, in a very interesting way addresses those two meanings that the aphorism can have. One is very humble. If you know, there weren't those giants before me, I couldn't have got where I am. But the other is, um, I'm even more a giant than those giants because I see further. So that's the two uh, implications of the aphorism. And where have we see it, seen it? Um, that's the British two, point, two, two pound coin. And on the side uh, of this coin, there is this saying, standing on the shoulders of giants, which nicely links to that discussion we had in the movie before. Should the giants be paid for me standing on their, sho on their shoulders? So me as a giant, could I hire out my uh, shoulders as a service to aspiring scholars? Uh, speaking about scholars, uh, a famous, world famous uh, search engine has also adopted um, that aphorism on uh, their uh, uh, start page for academic search. And uh, in that context, the stand on the shoulders of giants um, aphorism gets another um, interesting twist because, of course, it alludes to all the, the troubles of plagiarism and uh, unfaithful copying, not, not the naming your sources. Um, and the, the, the two troubles of monetizing and naming your sources are quite often mixed and will probably encounter that dilemma uh, over the course of my talk. I promise to start off the discussion of open source with the freedoms. And uh, there is one global big charter of freedoms, uh, which is the Declaration of Human Rights, the universal, as it called, Declaration of Human Rights. And this universal Declaration of Human Rights has a very famous Article 27, which is quite often cited in the context of copyright, and intellectual property rights, and open source, etc. And interestingly, people 
promoting copyright, and we've seen a lot and a lot and a lot of them, and the more open source gets stronger, the more uh, copyright people and IP, IP people start fighting back. And they quite often cite uh, the second sentence of Article 27, everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which he is the author. Leaving aside that there's only masculine formulations in there, um, citing only the, se the second sentence is taking away the first sentence, which there must be some wisdom when they wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that they put that first sentence in first and not second. And it reads, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. Now, that was also in the film. Content industry, of course, wants us to be consumers of content and interprets the participation in the cultural life as one sitting in the audience, sipping a glass of white wine and watching uh, people doing something funny or interesting or scientific or culturally valuable on stage. But that's not in the text. The text says, we humans do have a right to participate in the cultural life. And I think that's, that's important to take as a, as a premise. But we see that dichotomy between, between the freedom to, sh to take part in culture and the right to protection of moral and material interests. Again, this dichotomy. Let me move on to the freedoms as they're defined in free software. It's essentially free uh, for, for freedoms. We've encountered them this morning as well. The freedom to use software for any purpose, including commercially, the freedom to study, the freedom to copy, and the freedom to fork, to create your own mashups, revisions, etc. Um, so this, this first uh, freedom clearly states that using any piece of code for whatever purpose is okay, and that includes commercial purposes. And again, we encounter that dilemma um, of commercial use and uh, freedom to share. Luckily, in software, we have some 20 years of experience uh, of closed source and open source coexisting. There have been, uh, certainly in the, in, in the early years, in the, say, late 90s, those famous fights between open source promoters and Microsoft uh, sort of being shared, uh, scared to, to shit about this new movement that's coming up and that's taken away their market. And worse, it's not only taken away their market, it's taken away, away their talented engineers. But in, in, in a certain way, there, we have come to some kind of, of balance between uh, or, or agreed imbalance between open source and closed source. I mean, even those um, machines with the famous uh, fruit on their cover uh, use undercover some parts that uh, genuinely are open source software. And I guess um, this uh, famous other uh, American company wouldn't have got there where they are with their machines and their technology without using open source software. That's my humble opinion. Let's move on to the area of design. And at the same time, uh, let's not just go to design, but let's go to design policy and to that famous uh, report called Design for Growth and Prosperity. It was presented last year in uh, Helsinki. It's a report and recommendations of the European Design and Leadership Board to the European Union. Essentially, specialists in design telling the European Union what to do about design. They're addressing um, six strategic design actions. I spare you uh, the list of those. And they, this report includes, in total, 
21 recommendations. And of course, there is recommendation number three, work towards zero tolerance of infringement, or in short, strengthen IP muscle. Again, this message, we need to protect intellectual property and the European Union has to take action um, and, and has to set up a tribunal for European IP protection, etc. But then, a few pages on, the report recommends create guidelines, codes of practice, legal frameworks, and experimental spaces to promote the use of open design. Now again, in, uh, in, in this report, we see this dichotomy between wanting to be open and wanting to protect IP. And I think we need to take that as a premise that we've got both forces, the protectionist and the open sourcists, and if the world develops as it has developed in software, we might come to a situation where both live more or less happily or more or less in balance or in imbalance next to each other. How does that uh, connect to the Industrial Revolution? Let's go back to that idea of protection. And um, this is in, in, in copyright, in patents, in designs. We've had it in the film. The idea is you cannot protect ideas. You protect materializations of ideas, or what's then called the work. And I would like to pause with that word, work, for a second. Because in English, and it's probably something that uh, uh, is an advantage of the English language, work can be two things. It can be a noun, like the product, the work, the sculpture, the picture, uh, the movie. Or work can be the verb, to work, to do work. And I find it really interesting to, to see that shift and that emphasis that is put on the work as a noun, as opposed to work as an activity. And we now could you know, speculate and uh, start to cite, as uh, maybe some colleagues would cite Marx and, and alienation and how you know, uh, the worker is alienated from the product of his work and the product of his work belongs obviously to the capitalist, etc. Um, and when we're citing Marx, obviously um, this is a sort of unelegant um, shift to the Industrial Revolution. I'm using the Description of industrial revolutions in the sense of Jeremy Rifkin. Um, he's arguing in his latest book that all the time when we get a new energy paradigm and a new communication paradigm, then we do get an industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution, according to Jeremy Rifkin, in the 19th century, would have been triggered by the automatic printing press. Oh, that's only this screen. This screen was, t was talking to me in Spanish that he's going to switch off, so I was confused. Excuse me. Um, automatic printing press and steam power technology triggered uh, the, uh, the, the first industrial revolution. And of course, we do have Karl Marx as one of the big theorists of that time. And I've added a number of names on the right hand side there, we all know Henry Ford and his uh, automatic production system. Uh, you might have uh, heard of Frederick Taylor, the inventor of scientific management. I'm going to come back to him in a couple of slides as well. Um, he was sort of writing the theory of this kind of automation. And Frank Gilbert, very famous uh, for his time motion studies. Um, he had people stamp envelopes and build brick walls, film them, and optimized how they put the bricks on each other to become more efficient. So 
human efficiency as uh, the, the, the main goal of the first industrial revolution. Then there was a second one uh, with electrical communication, the oil powered combustion engine, which was a lot about uh, automatization, the first computers coming into uh, industry. A lot of that happened mainly post World War II. And uh, the funny thing in, is that in the 1980s, uh, we had a few authors looking at what this type of automation did to people. So we, we have uh, David Noble who actually um, traces back the history of automation since the late uh, 1800s. James Benninger was talking about the control revolution and uh, how technology and, and certain uh, economic uh, uh, factors were at the roots of information society. And Shoshana Zuboff did a very interesting um, longitudinal study in three, in three factories about the impact of what she then called the smart machine. Imagine that smart machine at that time, that's, that was computers from the 1970s. And the future of working power and how um, those control uh, mechanisms that were implemented even um, sort of broadened the divide between uh, the machine and the worker and put more control into the hands of management. Here comes uh, the third industrial revolution famously uh, um, written about by Jeremy Rifkin in his 2011 book um, caused by internet communication and uh, distributed renewable energy production. I've added two other authors. I might want to add uh, a couple more. Umar is talking about more values than just economic values that sort of would describe an economy, something that uh, colleagues this morning touched upon, and famously Yukai Benkler, and in the meantime, other economists um, actually proving through experimental econ economics that cooperation triumphs over self-interest and thus sort of questioning the basic assumption of what has been driving industry up to now. The really important bit about the Third Industrial Revolution is Jerry Merifking scaringly big on this screen. Um, he's going to give that to you in person, or I should say in copy, in video. Uh, that's from his presentation in uh, May last year, I believe, in uh, Brussels. We are on the cusp here in the European Union as the Vice President, Mr. Tanyani, has said, we're on the cusp of a new third industrial revolution here in Europe for the world. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 25 years. The personal computer and the internet. Now, what's so interesting for me, I'm clearly, I'm sure I'm the oldest person in this room. I grew up on centralized communication electricity, top down, one to many, 20th century. What's so interesting to someone my age is how the internet's organized as a communication media. It's, it, it's organized to be distributed and collaborative, and it scales to lateral power. Now, for my generation, lateral power must be an oxymoron. Power is always top down. But for all the young people in here that grew up in the internet, with peer-to-peer, side-to-side power, lateral power makes total sense. That's the consciousness shift. It's a fundamental paradigm shift in consciousness. This is power to the people. This is the democratization of the economy. This has huge implications for small and medium-sized enterprises, as the Vice President has said over and over, and producer cooperatives, and large companies as well. The first and second industrial revolution scaled vertically because the energies were elite, they were expensive. Centralized communication, expensive. You had to have a lot of financial capital to put the infrastructure and move it. That meant we needed to scale vertically with centralized factories, centralized supply chains, centralized logistics. And it favored national markets 
and national governments to regulate the first and second industrial revolution. The third industrial revolution doesn't scale vertically. That's why it's a new chapter for the SMEs and the producer co-ops and the consumers. It scales laterally. We are on the cusp here in the European Union. Oh, we heard that. We heard that. As the Vice President, Mr. Chagnani, has said, we are on the cusp of a new third and... Right. Just to illustrate those three um, industrial revolutions with some imagery, the first one about the automatic printing press, steam power technology, the second about electrical communication and oil-powered combustion engine, the third with internet and renewable energy. In terms of the icon machine, I call it, the icon machine for the first industrial revolution certainly is the steam engine. For the second one, it's a conveyor belt. For the third one, it's the 3D printer. And funny enough, we got one outside and you're even able to, to win it. I'm not saying that the steam engine equals the first revolution. I'm not saying the conveyor belt equals the second industrial revolution. And I'm certainly not saying that 3D printing, for God's sake, equals the third industrial revolution. These are just sort of the machine icons that help us understand what's going on. I have another analogy that helps us to understand what's going on. The icon role of the first industrial revolution was the capital capitalist, very obviously. The icon role of the second industrial revolution, and here I'm referring back to this idea of scientific management, which was kind of a result of the first industrial revolution, is the management consultant. But the icon actor of the third industrial revolution, and we've seen her before this morning, is the maker. In summary, the third industrial revolution scales laterally. And then I'm going to try to investigate what that means in the rest of my talk. It's a new chapter for the SMEs, for the producer co-ops, and the consumers. And if I would have been in Jeremy's place, I would have not used the word consumer, but the word prosumer, as you would have assumed. Now, scaling laterally, that is something that we know very little about. It certainly requires different forms of working together, which might include rules, like the freedoms we have seen in the first part, or like new practices, which we have been discussing this morning. And we want to look into practices a little more. Once again, as I did with the freedoms uh, and the definition of open source, let me start to look at practices in open source software. And this is that obviously famous quote uh, from open source chronicler Eric Raymond, his famous paper, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, going the, the, the Linux community, he was looking at the Linux community, describing what they've been doing and trying it on its own while developing an email client. The Linux community seemed to resemble a great babbling bazaar of different, differing agendas and approaches aptly symbolized by the Linux archive sites who take submissions from anyone out of which a coherent and stable system could seemingly emerge only by a succession of miracles. At that time, nobody really believed that an open source ecosystem with distributed actors all over the world, experienced programmers and less experienced programmers, could be able to build something like a cathedral without heavy central coordination. <coughs> Linux proved it, and a lot of uh, other open source 
software proved that it was possible. Open source projects depend on voluntary contributions. And that's an analysis that the colleagues at ETH Zurich did um, on categorizing bugs in software with the help of social networks. This is the notion of peer production we've been alluding to this morning. But if we step now from the software world to other worlds, of creation. I cannot help but cite myself. It would be naive to believe that open source software practices could be simply copied and applied to the manufacturing domain without any alteration or adaptation, ignoring the constraints and opportunities that the materiality of hardware entails. When I was writing that, um, two years ago, I was mainly thinking of how it gets messy when you start to work with hardware. A colleague of mine jokingly once said, you know, that's why it's called hardware, because it's hard. So let's have a look at uh, an example of a open source software contribution. Funnily, that's, uh, or not so funny. It's a contribution made in 1996 on July, July 3rd by Eric Raymond himself, where he merged two data structures into one. And you know, everybody, everybody who's into coding can uh, immediately read what's going on. Um, for those who are not into coding, this is a file that shows what has been taken out, which is colored red, and what instead has been put in, which is colored in green. So in coding, it's apparently very easy to communicate what we have done to a certain file, to improve it, to change it, add a little comment at the top, merged host rec and option structures and you can go and figure out for yourself with very little effort um, what actually the difference is, what the change is. Now look for instance at a sculpture or a painter or a movie maker or a dancer or an actor. It's so much harder to track those changes in a three-dimensional physical temporary word, world as opposed to code. And then I remember that way back in the 90s, I was actually um, working in a field that has sort of disappeared these days, I believe which was called knowledge management. Of course, that was the height of the second industrial revolution, the height of management consultancy. But not everything that we discussed those years in knowledge management is useless. Take, for instance, this diagram developed by uh, two Japanese guys, Nonaka and Takeuchi in uh, the mid-90s. They wrote a book, The Knowledge Creating Company. And they were looking at types of knowledge and essentially distinguished between explicit knowledge that is codified, can be written down, like the example we've seen in the software code, and tacit knowledge that cannot be easily expressed. That's in the gut feeling of a person who applies it, say an artist. And of course, in the times of knowledge management, we always try to make everything and anything explicit, ignoring, mostly, 
that there is a sphere of tacit knowledge which is highly valuable and essential to many design and artistic activity, which is impossible <coughs> to turn into explicit knowledge, or extremely hard to do so, or highly inefficient to do so, or loses a lot of its meaning if we try to turn it into explicit knowledge. Adding to that two statements from Hannah Arendt, The Human Condition, where she distinguishes between the homo faber and political action, going the isolation from others is the necessary life condition for every mastership which consists in being alone with the idea, the mental image of the thing to be. Contrasted to action as distinguished from fabrication is never possible in isolation. To be isolated is to be deprived of the capacity to act. I find that an extremely interesting dilemma if we're thinking about open source design or open design which is sort of very closely related to that homo faber activity and our idea that and our remit that or the European Union's remit that we should create practices regulations, experimental spaces for open design. Because creating experimental spaces or legislation is in its essence political action which requires to work collectively. Whereas design, at least according to Hannah Arendt, requires some sort of isolation. Reviewing. We've got this notion, this idea of lateral power. We've got this idea that of, of or, or this dichotomy between the homo faber and the political action. And we've got this trouble of tacit knowledge that to a certain extent needs to remain tacit to be valuable. And the question, how could we go on and realize a world where open design actually happens? And a lot of the talk this morning addressed quite a few of those issues. But if we look at another discipline of design, which is more where I'm coming from, which is called organizational design. If we look at management literature, if we look at literature in organization design, we're completely lost. We don't have a lot of handbooks, texts. We don't have consultants who can tell us what to do. And I felt this big question this morning with a colleague sitting here they're living that experiment. We're not entirely lost. Um, there have been, has been particularly one group uh, in the U US around uh, Eleanor Ostrom looking at the commons could be governed. How Ideas, artifacts, facilities support commons. How knowledge could be understood as a commons. There is a, a, a source of academic inspiration. But to the rest, I think we are actually left to 
go out into the world and do the experiment ourselves. One of the larger scale, if not largest scale, experiments in that area is the story of the fire blocks. Started something like 10 years ago. And I've tried to count the number of fab labs that existed per year. And I used as a proxy uh, the list of fab labs that were pre presented at the annual fab conference. And you see that growth from 2002 to 12, from very few to just above 70. Adding to that, that probably only half of the labs really went to that conference to present themselves, tells us that, yes, we do have a large growing community where we actually work ourselves on that weird concept of lateral power. I have to disappoint you because we don't have the answers. What we see happen in the labs are quite a lot of individualistic artistic projects, sort of according to Anna Harens, uh, Homo Faber. And we see a few more collaborative, more larger scale projects but they tend to sort of drift into a more techie uh, arena, like the Solar House or uh, the FabFi self-configuring wireless infrastructure. So we don't have the answers yet. But as I've been following, uh, certainly the development of FabLabs the last five years, I'd like to try to sketch where it could be going to then uh, open the floor to questions and disagreement. I mean, the essential question we're, we're facing is how can we build effective forms of collective action and self-organization in such a lateral environment? And not only something that works in my lab or in my city, but something that could work in my country, in my region, in my continent, maybe even globally. Second big question is how to protect the interests and creative freedom of makers while also ensuring wide access to new knowledge processes on products. Essentially, the dilemma that we inherited from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And of course, big question, also addressed this morning beautifully, how to appropriately and effectively create and capture value if we think beyond monetary systems. The funny thing is, in the Fab Lab ecosystem, when we face those questions, the suggestions quite often are, we need a central repository, we need a centrally maintained list of. We need one place to go where we find all the information. So people are used to give answers to those questions, but give answers to those questions in the old paradigm of the centralized hierarchical systems. That's not what we're looking for. And the funny thing is, so far, Every time we try to implement one of those centralized solutions, there was a lot of enthusiasm the first couple of weeks, and then they died. Which to me is sort of proof that these are not the right answers to the problems we are having. Speaking about capturing value, just two days ago, I got in the WIPO magazine, the World Intellectual Property Organization's magazine that tells us how important IP rights are. 
And they were going on about trademarks and telling us someday that creation may become something that many people want and as such may develop into an extremely valuable commercial asset. And that sentence essentially captures the idea behind intellectual property rights protection. You're betting on something that you have now that could be so good that a few years down the line, it, be, it would be valid a lot of money. I just can't see the difference between that and betting on Facebook stocks. However, I think that it's crucial that the community itself takes control of these developments, that the community itself invents structures, explores structures, fails with structures, develops new structures to actually develop instruments for lateral relationships. There is this notion of inverse infrastructures. There is this notion of taking responsibility. And we addressed that briefly this morning in the panel, that making is actually an act of taking responsibility. It's that step away from consuming. We need participative research and concurrent development in an emergent organization design. And when I listen to some of the arguments this morning, I had to add that picture to my presentation. 1524, iconoclasm, the destruction of icons in Zurich. Why am I putting that slide up here? I know I'm talking to an audience with a certain amount of designers. And I sometimes get the feeling, discussing with designers, that they, understood, they understand very well what they're doing, solving problems. And they start to extend that, trying to extend that expertise to areas where it's not about solving problems anymore. And in that sense, I would want to burn the image of the designer as the perfect problem solver, facilitator, user integrator, you name it. I wouldn't want to burn the image of the designer as such. I want to keep designers as problem solvers. But they cannot help us to find the path to the governance and the infrastructures of lateral power, they can contribute. But we have to find that way altogether. Because I believe that we're at the beginning of developing a new epistemic culture, or maybe even new epistemic cultures, and in the words of Karin Knorzetina, epistemic cultures are amalgams of arrangements and mechanisms, so stuff we sort of agree amongst us about, bonded through affinity, necessity, and coincidence, which in a given field make up how we know what we know. And these new 
epistemic cultures are beyond the traditional disciplines of the engineer and the designer and the sociologist and the management consultant and the capitalist. They're blurring those, bound those boundaries between the classical distinctions. We need many of those ingredients to come to new arrangements and to find new mechanisms. Because we need them, because we can build on each other's experience and knowledge, because we just happen to be in the same place, in the same economic situation. The only thing what we shouldn't do is fall back to traditional structures and implement traditional ideas. Because, as Yokai Benkler warned us, we might miss the chance to benefit from a distinctive social technical system that promotes not only cultural and intellectual production, but on another level, constitutes a venue for human character development. And in my view, that's the important essence of combining open design and the chance we've got through the Industrial Revolution that we're living through now. On this journey, I believe, we have to be prepared to get surprised. We must dare to fail, and we will have to disagree. And please do disagree, but constructively. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Alistair here. Um, just picking up on the last bit, because I think it's really important, and I think we are perhaps agreed in the de debate today that we're on a learning curve here. But this idea of um, agreeing to disagree in, in uh, design activism, which is a growing debate, I think, and it's coming from lots of different people, academics, practitioners, and those who might not call themselves traditionally designers. But there are some strategies which are emerging. I call it the three A's theory, agreement, agonism, and antagonism. And I think open design has also got to learn this route. At what point does it do things through consensus, agreement? At what point does it do things through provocation, antagonism? And at what point does it do things through discourse? It probably does the first two quite well, consensus and discourse, so agreement and agonism, but the last one, antagonism, and this is my question, are we simply being too quiet and too modest and too agreeable and should we be a little bit more provocative? So that's my question. The short answer obviously is yes, we should, but then Obviously, you would ask me, OK, but how should we do that? Um, in the development of open design as, as this community of consensus and discourse, we're still at the very beginning. I mean, this conference here, which is very much about consensus and discourse, is only in its second year. So strengthen that community that we're in and actually strengthen our own standing that, yes, what we're doing might sound weird, but this is the future. And those people who argue, but, 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 just don't understand it yet. We need to, to, to get there where we can stand in front of an audience of, of 300 people and say that. But then, we need to go to that audience of 300 people who is not in agreement with what we all agree here, where we actually can get that disagreement, where we actually can pick a fight. 
in a, in a figurative sense, because it's, it's no use uh, kicking a, a, an IP protectionist uh, from an open designer's view and vice versa. It's not going to lead us anywhere. I tried to show a number of, of dilemmas in my talk. And I think what we really need to develop individually, but also culturally and, and in society, is productive ways to live with those dilemmas. To find, hopefully, a balance between protectionism and open between making money from, every, from, from any and everything we do and uh, a sharing or gift economy. Hopefully a balance, or at least a sort of agreed imbalance. That's where we need to get. And we need to seek that sort of confrontation, that sort of confrontational audience, to be actually in a position to start to develop that thinking. And in this sense, I'm extremely positively surprised that the design recommendations to the European Commission actually contain both the strength and the IP muscle bit and the open source experiment bit. That's, that's a good starting point. More questions? There one in the back? No? Hi. Um, I actually have a question. I'm a bit embarrassed to ask this um, because obviously I'm organizing this, so in some way I must have faith in, in the whole project, but very often I wonder, um, is this really something that can move beyond a, a kind of closed and, and self-serving ecosystem of people who are interested in this and really affect the mainstream in meaningful ways, or are we just um, deluding ourselves? That would be my question. <laughs> And, and obviously, from, from your point of view, it would be very sad if we just would be deluding ourselves. Sort of waste of time, isn't it? Um, I believe that, speaking of time, time will help us in two ways. A, this group has been growing immensely over the last years. And there, there are people in here who have been looking closely at uh, open design over the last almost 10 years and they can certainly confirm that. So in that sense, time will help us as we grow. But time will help us in a very interesting and quite different way. And we start to see that happening in software, we see that happening in hardware, and we see that happening in stem cell biology. Development, certainly in these three areas where I've seen it myself, are moving ahead so quickly that any process of protecting IP, closing down IP, etc., will slow down the, the development process to, in, in such a, an amount that actually development is not possible anymore. So there are, it's still pockets, but there are pockets and disciplines out there where they have to revert to open source in order to keep developing. And I believe that this kind of acceleration that we see generally in our lives um, is going to help us to promote that open source approach because we don't have to waste time in protecting or energy or money in protecting. We can create and move on and create and move on. So in that sen sense, I'm, I'm very positive about it.
Hello. Could you please elaborate a little bit more about the idea of the third industrial revolution and the um, renewable energies and its relationship with the 3D printer? Because in the two first ones, it's, I think, quite clear, but then the relationship between the um, renewable energies today, especially if we say we are in this third industrial revolution today, and, the th and 3D printing as the icon machine of this age is not clear for me. Okay. Um, I'll address the two of them uh, separately. First, renewable energies. Um, traditional energy uh, grids are designed to have big power plants that are close to big energy consumers and then from, from a central point distribute energy to uh, the rest of the consumers. There are plans to deal with renewable energy exactly the same way, like big wind farms offshore, big uh, solar power stations in the Sahara, and then through thick cables, uh, pump energy across to Europe and stuff like that. Um, leaving away the argument of geopolitical stability and uh, you know who owns that cable and who controls that cable, uh, from a, from a technical standpoint, it makes much more sense to generate renewable energy not in a centralized manner, but in a distributed or local manner. So in that sense, it uh, links directly to, to the idea of, of lateral power that's also uh, uh, present in the communication structure of the internet. That was the, the energy bit. So it, it, it makes technologically, it makes more sense, and, and sociopolitically, it makes more sense. And we've seen that, for instance, um, um, with the wind farm development in Scotland. Uh, there were various approaches to, to set up wind farms in Scotland, because Scotland has uh, probably the most wind in Europe. There were plans by big uh, energy suppliers and they always run into massive troubles of acceptance of those windmills, etc. But when local uh, city councils, local island councils started to build their own windmills, that was totally socially acceptable because they were producing energy for themselves. With technolo technological reasons and social political reasons, um, let's say renewable energy should be uh, generated locally on a community basis. The issue of the 3D printer, um, again, leaving aside the hype that 3D printing uh, uh, has been created around 3D printing in the last couple of years, uh, 3D printing today and uh, exemplified by the machine that stands outside uh, is a technology that brings digital manufacturing to very close to individuals and into the reach of individuals as do fab labs, as does a, a, a lot of, of development that's happening in, uh, in digital fabrication. And as fabrication becomes more accessible to individuals or communities, there is the potential to shift centralized production that today is offshore to uh, mainly China, Taiwan, uh, to, to bring that back to continental dimensions, regional dimensions, national or local dimensions. And in that sense, again, uh, digital fabrication, where the 3D printer stands uh, as a symbol for, um, homes in on this idea of, of lateral structures rather than centralized hierarchical structures. Hello, Peter, my old friend. <laughs> I think we have been met in a couple of countries in the last months, and uh, it's it's very nice to hear from you uh, how the speech is evolving with the time. But I I I would like to argue and, and not disagree, but you know, uh, let's say to 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 maybe bring up like a reflection about where how the technologies has have been created and in which context and in which context are we today now? Um, mainly because. Um, also, you know, I've been reflecting as, 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 as you have done about 
how technology or how these previous industrial revolutions had, had been created. And, and one of the things that, that I, I realized and I, and, I, and I got to find is that there are two things, or, or maybe three things. No? The, one is the race of an empire <laughs> that really th drives the creation of new technologies. Then the other thing is the appearance of a crisis that is also driving the, the creation of new technology. And when maybe most recently, in, 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 in everything that we are sitting today and what we are using, all what we have in our pockets, and, 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 and mostly all the creations that we, we take today as technologies that we are using, came from the, from the military industry, right? So mainly with the first and second World War Wars, and then with the Cold War, even the internet is a creation from the DARPA net, and, and it's actually a creation to, to fight the Russians by the Americans, no? in, a, in a way to be protected. So my question is, in, in this sense, um, how, which are the conditions today, which seems to be pretty obvious, no? We say we're a crisis, we're in a crisis, there are no jobs, etc. But, but at the same time, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are still running the world economy. And, 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 and it, yeah, they were created in the 50s in the Bretton Woods Agreement. So it, the, the thing is, where we should get to that point of crisis in which a real change in technology will be created. I, I mean real change in technology because I, I don't believe that 3D printing is there yet to change that. And you know, you, you know that we agree on that. And yeah, we can make really nice gadgets and, and you know, we can, it's giving access to people to new tools, but, but we are not there yet in digital fabrication. So uh, uh, which are those conditions that you think we, are, we, are, we should get on? You know, it's, it's, I know it's not an easy question, but I would like to, to know your insights about it. Um, I would rephrase the question and say, what are, what are the infrastructures that we're using? Where are they coming from? And I would agree with you, they all come from that centralized uh, period of time, military period of time, uh, almost. And I was sort of stupefied this morning uh, with the WeShare uh, presentation and seeing Google there as the choice of platform. When we all know that Facebook knows what we're saying, but Google knows what we're thinking. And do we really want to do that? Do, you, do we really want to have that, that kind of centralized, hierarchically, hierarchically controlled uh, infrastructure on which we start to build our new world, to express, in that, uh, express it in that word. So what, what would be the pains that would drive us to de develop our own infrastructures? And one pain that I could imagine is when Google turns sour. And that's kind of the, the sword of Damocles hanging over us. You know, everything is on the Google Docs and Google Calendar. When is that going to fire back? Or is it? Or can we trust them? So a, 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 a breach of trust between all us users and Big G, that could be one of the triggers to think about our own infrastructure. I mean, the whole PRISM issue is one such a potential trigger to think about our own infrastructures. But then the big challenge, I was talking about how do we organize ourselves. Then the big challenge comes, OK, we're now sort of relying on that global infrastructure, be it the internet, be it uh, Big G and, and others. Can we then, from a lateral sort of grassrootish, maybe not ex exactly grassroot, can we from that lateral environment quickly enough build our own infrastructure to thrive on? And that's probably going to be one of the biggest challenges where we would need a lot of bright minds, not just the two of us, and not everybody in this auditorium, but 
the whole movement globally to, again, interconnect and, and reinvent ourselves, really, fundamentally. It's not exactly a, an answer to your question, but a, a speculation where it, where it could go. But I think um, we're running out of time here. Thank you very much, Thomas, for that uh, inspiration, inspirational point. We'll have time to discuss that further and develop it. Promise. Thank you.